let's swing back and let's talk about that API version line, which is inside of all manifest again. Now, as you can see, I wrote something entirely ridiculous right there. There is no API version honka bonka in Kubernetes, at least not yet. But point is, is that I want you to imagine that this is the scenario. The day is yesterday. This manifest worked. Version honka bonka is good. Each and every one of these different parameters that you set were all accurate. Things were doing well. Today, we rolled out a new cluster at a later version than the one we had yesterday. Suddenly, your manifests don't work. And suddenly, you're getting messages that look like this. There are no matches for kind pod in version honka bonka, which is the hilarious message that I actually want to see. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I thought version two was too boring. So what is this saying? Remember, Kubernetes communicates everything through APIs. And when you are upgrading Kubernetes, what you are upgrading are its APIs. You are upgrading its ability to recognize, configure, and manage different kinds of resources. And those change. So what does that mean for you? Well, if you want to be like a real pro at Kubernetes, like if you just want to make everybody think you're such a pro at it, every time that somebody talks about upgrading a cluster, I just want you to go, oh, just like making that exact sound. Because nobody likes upgrading clusters. It's such a huge pain. And looking at this deprecated API migration guide here, just take a look with me. In version 1.32, it's telling us that this type of resource called a flow control, its API version went from V1 beta three to V1. What it's also telling us is that, and it's using dot notation here. Remember how in pods, like under spec, we would set containers and then the name of the container. Here it's saying that for this particular object under spec is a section called limited and under that is a key called nominal concurrency shares. Right. It's telling us that its default values are changing. All right. So that's what happens as you go from version to version of Kubernetes. You have to update your API version. Suddenly, fields might mean something different than what they originally did. Or some fields might get added or some fields might get taken away. And you can scroll through this and you can see all of the different changes. And that's just the nature of the beast when you're working with Kubernetes. Let's talk about resource management next. So a Kubernetes cluster is an aggregate of all the nodes that are networked together in order to create one whole. And what you have to be doing is constantly keeping an eye on how many resources are being consumed and setting up reasonable guideposts and guardrails to make sure that isn't being exceeded. There are lots of third party tools that you can integrate into Kubernetes, like some of them really pretty and really visual, but there are a few that you can uh, install that are easily used, even the most vanilla of setups. Cube control top is one of them, but cube control top, if you are building a cluster from scratch, chances are it's not going to work. You're going to get this error metrics API not available. What we need to do is that we need to apply this uh, manifest here, which is provided by a GitHub repo from Kubernetes. And what that's doing is making a whole bunch of objects, some of which we'll talk about inside of this course, some of which we won't, although we will, of course, inside of the full course. Um, we need to give that a minute to spin up. But what I just did is that I just created a bunch of pods that are gathering and harvesting information about other pods and the nodes inside of our cluster. These uh, cluster roles and role bindings and cluster role bindings are what are giving those pods permission to do that. And the stuff about service accounts and stuff can wait uh, for a little later. Point is, is that we want that to run for a little bit and I'll just kind of pause here for a second and let it finish up. There we go. Once that API service uh, metrics is telling us that, hey, I'm up and running, true, now I can start using kubectl top. So here's that kubectl top nodes command again. 
Check it out. It's telling me what percentage of available CPU and memory has been used on the nodes inside of my cluster. That's really nice. What's an also a nice use case for cube control top is pods. If I were to cube control top pods, remember, just like with cube control get and describe, it's only going to look for pods in the current namespace. I don't have any pods in my current namespace. So what I can do is I can type top pods all namespaces or if you want to look cool dash capital a and here we can see that uh the pigs of our uh, cluster are definitely these two calico pods that's to be expected they are our networking uh it's what's holding our nodes together basically but this is a great tool to like quickly see like which of your pods are like just out of control, consuming the most resources, which is a great way to troubleshoot and figure out what needs to be done to rectify the situation. All right, a little death by PowerPoint here, but we're gonna continue talking about resource control. What we're gonna be doing really soon is that we are going to be editing our pod manifests and we're gonna give them more parameters and we're gonna make them more in line with the way that we want them to behave. Specifically, we want them to behave themselves when it comes to resource consumption. And it's a fine line to walk, right? Because the containers inside of your pods, they need resources to live. You don't want them to starve to death. But at the other hand, you don't want them to be pigs. You don't want them to consume more than they need. So there are ways to set those. Requests are a parameter that you can set inside of your manifest that guarantees that your pod has a certain amount of resources. That's good because otherwise your containers are going to starve. Give them the, give them the oxygen, man. They need to breathe. And then there are limits. It's not unheard of for containers to just go amok and just start consuming like rogue like amounts of resources. Limits are what put a hard cap on how many resources containers can shove inside of their face. I think that's much easier to understand because I'm pretty sure we can all uh, identify. <laughs> all right, so what would it look like adding these onto our manifest? Let's take a look. Now, it's important to note that when we are controlling the amount of resource consumption here, look at the level of indentation. Do you see how we are adding this section to this particular container? So requests and limits are set on a container by container basis. Make sure that that's clear. And under resources is where we can add those two sections, requests and limits. And indented under that is where you can control, all right, what's the minimum amount of resources as far as maybe CPU and memory is concerned. I want my pods to have at least, let's say 65 uh, megabytes of memory. And when it comes to CPU, here's something unique to Kubernetes. If one core is equal to 1000 millicore what the heck is that millicore allows you to like further specify there's only so much of the cpu timing that i want to use i don't want to use a full core i can actually say at the very least make sure that i get 250 millicore worth of cpu and pretty much the same thing applies down here at the bottom except limits must be at least the same as the requests. I would get an error if I tried to set the limit lower. But let's set a limit of 500 and let's set a memory of 130, basically doubling it. And if I were to create this object right now, it would work. Now, let's take a look back at that namespace we were looking at earlier. Do you remember when I put a resource quota on top of it saying that, uh, hey, any uh, pods that get created inside of this namespace are going to have to follow the rules? Well, watch this. If I put a watch on here, then we can see this happen in real time. But I'm going to go ahead and create this pod here. And I'm going to put it inside of the demo namespace. 
the second that I did that, look what happened. Immediately, that resource quota said, all right, you've already consumed X amount of resources. You've already requested that much to be used. And what that means is, is that I could keep making more pods exactly like this one, but only up until I reach what the resource quota amount has been. So a resource quota, the way that it works is that it's kind of like the bouncer that's standing outside of the nightclub, right? When you've hit the maximum amount of people that you're allowed to let inside of the club because, you know, like there's fire code rules or something, at that point, you start turning people away. You start saying, no, no more, we're full up, go home. It's the same with making pots. Let's just do an illustration real quick to see how that changes. So suppose that we create a pod with that request and limit in a certain namespace. We have a resource quota where it says that, hey, you can only use up to 400 megabytes in memory, 500 megabytes in limits. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that what the resource quota now is doing is that it's being much more granular. Resource control can be super granular to the point that it's kind of confusing. But it is possible to really spell out in your resource quota just exactly how high you want certain amounts to go. So watch what happens when we add another pod that also has a request of 100 and a limit of 200. Notice that with that limit of another 200, we are currently up to 400 megabytes of the 500 that we're total allowed to have here. If I try to make one more pod, that is going to be in excess of 500, which means that this pod would be denied. It would not be allowed to be created inside of our cluster.